Thank you to the Centre for having me, and thank you to Charlie for that lovely introduction. You may be wondering, um, first of all, given my, my biography that was just given, I do work a lot in digital research infrastructure, and particularly at the European level. But when you work in research infrastructure, and I think to a certain extent these days when you work in the digital humanities, um, you start to find that you've, you put yourself into sometimes uncomfortable positions. You find that you're creating systems, and very large systems, that may have an impact on how we understand history, how we understand culture. And from that slight dis-ease came for me an interest in questions of, well, how do the arts and humanities help us to understand technology? We talk a lot about how technology helps us understand the humanities, but I was interested in the other side, and that's a bit of what you're going to hear today. Although if you want to talk about research infrastructure afterwards, I'm always happy. Thinking about this question of, okay, well, if technology is helping us understand the humanities, what can the humanities help us understand about technology? There are, there are a few friends I've made intellectually along the way. And certainly, when Alan Liu started to talk about the, 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 the cultural singularity and how the lack of a cultural criticism was blocking the digital humanities from becoming a full partner of the humanities, I felt that this was an important moment. And I also felt that perspectives such as the one that Gary Hall puts forward about how it's not just interesting what computer science can offer the humanities, but what the humanities can offer computer science. And I thought there was a real interesting question there. And within my institution, I also wear another hat. I'm a, an, a, a, an investigator in a large national computer science research institute. And this raised all these questions, the conversations you have as someone trained in literature, sitting in a research institute for personalization and adaptive computing, do lead you to ask these questions and come up with some answers. And the main project I'm going to be talking about, the real context for what I'm going to be telling you about today, is a project we call Kplex, or Knowledge Complexity. A Kplex is very interesting. I don't know if any of you have had the joy of applying for European research funding. But this is what's called a sister project. You probably didn't even know there was such a thing as sister projects. And the sister projects are an instrument that was devised so that researchers coming from an arts and humanities background could help to expose bias in computational research. And I thought that's the kind of thing we need to be doing more of. So this is actually a project that's affiliated with the Big Data PPP, the Public-Private Partnership in Big Data, which says to you that not only is there a research imperative there, but also a corporate imperative that we're resisting in our sister project bias-finding sort of way. And what we proposed to do is to look at a number of things within the, the, the culture of big data research that we thought might expose some biases and give us some ways to look at possible interventions from a humanistic point of view that could be made to improve the research in terms of its social impact and in terms of its technological robustness. Because we do believe that if you improve the research generally, you can improve the technology as well. So the things that we're looking at primarily are, first of all, discourses of data, how we talk about data because how we talk about things, I don't need to tell people in this room, how we talk about things is important to how we understand them. Um, we talk about hidden data, not necessarily things that are hidden to keep them hidden, but hidden because of accidents of history. Largely, this comes from a perspective of looking at uh, cultural heritage collections in Europe, where you would have many that are very, very well exposed, the UK, France, Germany, and then you'd have others 
that are essentially invisible from a digital point of view, primarily, for example, Eastern Europe. We look at what we call the epistemic marking of data. I'll talk later about uh, work about how data is never raw. You always have someone who created the data. And if they didn't create the data, they created the instrument. And if they didn't create the instrument, they created the sensor. So data always comes from somewhere. There's always a human bias in it. And finally, we're looking at complexity and the representations of complexity and how in technological systems, sometimes these representations of complexity can be lost, can be smoothed over to our detriment as users. And you can see we have a number of partners. It's not a big project, but it's been a very influential one. And it all started, I think, the day I saw this billboard in the London Underground. It wasn't exactly this billboard because my picture is not as good as this. The fact that there was a data analytics company out there who could imply that analyzing big data was the secret to living happily ever after disturbed me greatly. Because there is this almost fetishization of big data. And we know that big data can be powerful. We know that it can be deployed, for example, towards public health crises and, and to answer certain kinds of questions. But the idea that generically you could say, you could take the fairy tale trope, you know, taking the literary trope, that, that's my turf. So I felt like we had to push back against this and find out, well, where is the real intersection? Because we know as well that AI and big data, obviously they're related phenomena, quite different in some ways, but they have similar effects sociologically, um, have baked in prejudices, they have baked in biases. So if we in this project were there to expose biases, then this was certainly the place to start. So I'm going to take a few topics out of the universe of our project and expand a bit about them. And the first one I want to talk about is words. Amongst humanists, you can always talk about words. And we started by extracting, and you don't need to read all this, it's more there to show you that this exists. We started extracting some of the definitions of data that are out there. Now this is actually from the scientific literature about data. So these are the people who are actually writing so as to define data. And you find that there are so, there's such variety there that it's actually quite difficult to find any sort of coherence. You have data as pre-analytical, it's pre-factual, it's false, but data that is false is still data. Data has no truth. It is resisting analysis. It's neither truth nor reality, but it may be facts. Um, it's a fiction of data, it's an illusion, it's performative. It is um, a, a sort of actor. And it has a very distinct set of, of um, properties for others. For example, the difference between data and capta, something that is given and something that is taken. So we knew once we found this kind of diversity, even in the, the discourse, the scientific discourse of people who are studying science and looking at data, that we were going to find more when we looked into the practice of this. So, the next thing we looked at um, is we looked at the ways in which big data researchers talk about data. And what we kept finding is big data researchers talk about data all the time. You can see uh, 659 occurrences across, what do we have here, two, four, six papers. And in fact, the worst offender we found of using the word data so much that it almost becomes empty was one paper, 21 pages long, in which the word data was used 500 times. So when you look at that, you realize they can't be meaning the same thing every time. Um, and what we did find, again, digging through some of these papers, is that data can mean comparatively simple strings, or it can be complex human-created records. Same word two very different phenomena. It can be simple records and complex hybrid, hybrid objects. So it can be individual records or it can be agglomerations of records. It can be something newly drawn out of the environment or it can be something previously available for access, analysis, and navigation. It can be pre epistemic It can be pre-processed. It can be of direct use to humans or purely machine readable. 
And of course, it can protect, it can inhabit all sorts of different qualities. It can be relevant, contextual, various, external, complex, rich. Note that none of these actually tell us what the data is. They just tell us more or less how the researcher feels about it. And my researcher pulled out a couple of quotes and was kind of stomping around the office one day with these, simply because she felt that this was really, these were indicative of the way in which not only was this your normal sort of jargon, but the fact that the word data is so prevalent in these statements that are made makes it almost obscure to, to anyone, makes it obscure to understanding. So data pretreatment module is outside from online component and is done to pre-process stream data from the original data, which is produced by the previous component in the form of data stream. Or we calculate the standard deviation for the entire data in the stream to check whether all of the data are of the same value or not. And or due to visiting data once during the processing data in stream, the performance of processing data is crucial. Data, data, data. Um, and we thought, OK, is this just the fact that we're looking at big data research? Is there a, something here that is unique? And what's interesting is you do have scenarios and schemas and standards for how to talk about different levels of data, for example, the, the NASA data levels. But what we found interesting about this is that the transformations that occur as you work through data, so the cleaning, the scrubbing, the cleaning and scrubbing as opposed to the dirty data, by the way. Note the, the, the words there and how some are positively valenced and some are negatively valenced. But what's interesting about NASA is that you can process data up to a level of maybe four, up to a level of five. And so then you have much refined data. If another researcher takes that data to use in a different context, it reverts back to level zero. So even the more well-defined and well-developed schemas for working with data, they have a very different sort of way of viewing provenance and the, 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 the impact that the individual researchers may have on what they're doing to the data. Now, I began to wonder if this was just an epistemic thing. So, and this is based on some work I did a few years ago about, is it, does it have to do with the way humanists, and in this case, particularly, this was work done in historians, how they create data and, and how they view data? Um, because if you read work on epistemic cultures, like Karen Norsatina's epistemic cultures, um, you see that there's a real difference. You know, not there's a tendency to say that humanists don't collaborate, or that humanists, you know, the epistemic process is entirely encapsulated in the writing, or you'll have others who say that humanists don't create knowledge at all; they make it all up. You know, you've heard all of these better and worse conceptions about what makes the two cultures debate. For me, it stands in the instrumentation. So for a, a physicist working at CERN or at the, the, the European Spallation Source, the question of instrumentation will have to do with physical instruments. Um, in a microbiology lab, it has to do with repeatable processes. For the humanist, it's about layering different kinds of source material. So you have your primary sources, your secondary sources. It's more like building a dry stone wall in which you'll see gaps. But one of the things that you note is if you're looking at these kinds of things that go into that humanistic instrument, you're not really going to find anything that you can even pretend to call raw data. The, the, the fingerprints of the human beings who've come before are always front and center within that kind of, of source material, which brought us to thinking about the differences between this one epistemic culture where the word data was so prevalent in our own culture, um, which leads me to the you say tomato, I say data, because all of these words that we were finding were so diverse in the humanities research were actually quite the same. So every one of these can be mapped to the word data in some ways in computer science research. So if there is one sort of leitmotif or uh, ein roter Faden, for the, the, the work I'm presenting to you today is that um, it, it's that there's a lot more confidence that we as humanities researchers or those from a background in humanities researchers can take when looking at technology. Because there's a lot that we can see 
and a lot that we can sense, and a lot that we do differently in very positive ways. So what does all of this mean when we come to big data? Well, big data essentially magnify, magnifies these issues bigly. We, we, any, any word that has anything to do with big is very popular in my office right now. Um, because obviously, magnification of errors makes them bigger. Magnification of misunderstandings makes them bigger. And when you have larger and larger agglomerations, the likelihood that these are going to come in in ways that affect the, the, what can be done with the data, it raises. The black boxes get deeper, they get blacker, and then there's this risk of what we call epistemological fallout, where if interdisciplinary work is grounded on manifold, unresolved, and undocumented, and potentially contradictory, aberrant, and idiosyncratic understanding of the term, then you can come to a point of crisis. And I think anyone who works in the digital humanities has had that conversation. I need the data. I gave you the data. Well, do we want more data? Well, I have the data. You can have these entire conversations where two people think they agree, but they mean something completely different around single terms, single words, such as data. Data is only one. So you can have problems coming out of this. And one of the things we're realizing is that the problems are not just in research. The problems are also potentially social, because we know there are problems with how people out in the world deal with their data in terms of privacy and in terms of their own, how they develop identities, how they interact with their worlds. Um, and I think a good example of this, again, this is from the digital humanities, but I think it points in the direction of the importance of what we call things. My engineering colleagues have often said to me, I have a problem to solve. It doesn't, I don't want to talk about what we call things. I want to solve the problem. And I recognize that that is almost a, a caricature of an engineering bias. But we need to be very careful. And I don't know if you know this, this Twitter um, back and forth between Miriam Posner and Bethany Nowitzki. This came on the heels of a funding call, the Digging Into Data Challenge, where the number of female applicants was so low as to be very noticeable. And when it was queried, the, the, the funder said, well, we'd love to have more female applicants, but there was no bias in the system. And the discussion here is, well, is there actually a bias? When you learn, use words like dig and mine, is there something insensibly masculine, inherently masculine about that language that causes people maybe to pull back if, they've, if that's not how they see their research? So maybe it's not that it's what girls really dig is unicorns and sparkles and boys, but maybe it's the whole digging in trope. Is it not my personal brand of scholarship or a rhetorical turnoff? So again, you have to wonder if words like data can become maybe not a rhetorical turnoff, but a sort of a turnoff that leads people into a false sense that all data is the same and a false inability to differentiate between the data they don't want widely shared and the data they maybe do want broadcasted and widely shared. So that's my first topic. My second topic is about memory. Humanists talk a lot about memory. I think memory and identity are probably two of the largest umbrellas under which you can group research in the humanities, whether it be into literature, languages, culture. But in KPLEX, in this European sister project, we talk a lot about memory as it is encoded, memory as it is held in institutions, memory as it is made accessible as cultural memory to people who might want to research it or people who might want to use it. And you may or may not know the enumerate survey, but when you look at the levels of how much cultural heritage material in Europe is digitized, particularly if you look at archival material, 13%, and actually if you dig into those numbers, it's even a little bit lower, because a lot of what you find that has been digitized, they're more the administrative systems and, and records within the, the archives. And that's fine, but more and more there's going to be an expectation, if there is there, that in a big data universe, we will all be able to access big data approaches, that problems will be able to be solved, questions will be able to be asked. But if the data is not there, if the data remains hybrid between the analog and the digital, well, what happens then? 
So we have questions there around how we deal with the cultural memory of Europe and beyond. And I'm always told, I, I often ask about provenance as being an important part of cultural heritage data. And I'm often told, well, there are W3C standards for provenance. Um, and this is a, a colleague from a library actually tried to map some of that out. But when I think about the provenance of cultural heritage, I think about things like this. So this was a, a record I found about a collection in the west of Ireland, which is quite interesting because obviously the collection was related to papers of Roger Casement. And it tells, it tells the whole story. And I don't know what, bar, what parts of this history, of this narrative of that particular data set I don't know what parts are the most important. Is it that they relate to casement and that they're in the Clare County Council archives? And by the way, there's no particular reason for casement's records to be in Clare. He had no particularly strong link to Clare. Was it the fact of who they were found by? The fact that they were kept under lock and key? The fact that the council didn't even know they had them? Well, he was a controversial figure. Was it the fact that it came from a German U-boat, or that he was on a German U-boat? Was it the fact that these records were handed over um, by a, a member of the, the, the European nobility? I mean, what, what is important about this provenance? And how does that map onto a standard? How could this be standardized at all? So again, there are things that we're going to remember and things that we're going to forget. And we in the digital humanities have always recognized problems with this. Um, and I think one of my favorite examples of how to really look at these problems is um, Todd Presner's article about the ethics of the algorithm, where he looks very much at the how the, the Shoah visual history archive was marked up in a way to try and make it into a research resource. But because it was marked up by humans, you're always going to find human fallibility and human interpretation in that. And I, I would encourage you to read the, the article because obviously there are both things that make the algorithm more ethical because it allows you to not be distracted either by the paradigmatic individuals or by the mass of something, the mass of the, the big data related to the Holocaust, but also how that, that meso layer can be problematic if you have human consciousness behind it. Which leads me to the question of the European Open Science Cloud. Going from the Showa Visual History Archive to the European Open Science Cloud implies all sorts of things, which I'm not necessarily going to, to, to dig into. But um, there is an expectation that research in Europe in the next, not even five years, in the next two years, will become underpinned by this cloud of data where we're all going to share our data. Now, if you are or were a humanist, you recognize that there's a problem here because I work a lot with historians and they don't own their data. They have a shared ownership of their data with the cultural heritage institutions. I, as a literary scholar, don't own my data. I share it with the publishers. I share it with the authors. And it was really disturbing to me uh, to see in the, um, the program for the governance of the European Open Science Cloud, which is going into build phase. This is coming. Um, and it will be something we will all have to use, which with my Daria hat on, I do worry about. If you look at that list of stakeholders, where are the publishers? Where are the libraries? Where are the museums? Where are the archives? They're actually not there. So the whole idea that there would be research data that would have this kind of complex social embeddedness is something that the European Commission, even looking at research data and trying to move us to the point where we can ask questions and, and discover knowledge in the big data of European research, even there we're finding blind spots that as a humanist seem, well, rather obvious. And of course, there are other assumptions that we make around big data and memory. There's a lot of people who think, well, the fact that we have the Internet Archive is fine. The fact that we have the Wayback Machine means that digital memory is protected. But I certainly was surprised when I first realized that there's a lot of not only link rot uh, within the, the digital archiving, but also that the use of the Memento pro Protocol, which allows sites to be sampled at different times in different measures, 
means that you can find sites that actually never existed, where the, the pastiche of pieces coming together means that what you have is records of a history that never was. And that's a little bit scary as someone who has a, has a, a deep investment in the importance of historical research. Now, of course, there's social levels for memory and forgetting as well. And I think in Europe we are in an interesting place because obviously we are the place where you can have a, a public dialogue and, and a, um, a court-based, a legal dialogue about the right to be forgotten. And of course, where we're all looking towards the idea that the, 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 the general data protection regulation is going to make, as scientists make our lives perhaps more difficult, but also introduce protections for people in the world of big data. Um, but on a more fundamental level, I think that there are things that we are outsourcing about how we culturally remember and culturally forget. And I thought that this quotation from um, Meyer Schoenberger was really interesting. The whole idea that without some form of forgetting, forgiving becomes a difficult undertaking. This is precisely that kind of human value that we're seeing eroded in uh, an, an, the an anonymity of the internet. So the question is, how can we build better structures for both the remembering and the forgetting in the digital age? And the third topic I wanted to talk about was complexity. I love it when computer science researchers say, we want to reduce complexity. I say, no, 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 don't take away my complexity. I need my complexity, but I need a way through it. Um, and again, one of the starting points for me for thinking about this is the fact that raw data really is an oxymoron. There is no such thing as raw data. And one of the examples I like to give, and one of the examples we're looking at as a, as a sort of a, 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 a place to investigate this in Kplex's machine translation. So Google Translate, you know, a haiku, a Japanese haiku, a famous Japanese haiku. Google Translate gives us the sound of water to dive an old pond frog. Okay, so it gives us a bit of a word salad. But what I think is more interesting is what human beings have done with this in the past. Um, old pond, frogs jumped in, sound of the water. Lovely. Lafcadio Love her and the, uh, the, the Irish Japanese patriot of two countries. Um, the old pond, a frog jumped in, kerplunk. Well, that's got to be Allen Ginsberg, you know, a nice sense of the, 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 the rhythm and the sound of the language. And of course, um, I do live not too far from Limerick in Ireland. So we have, there once was a curious frog who sat by a pond on a log. And to see what resulted in the pond catapulted with a water noise heard round the bog. Each of these takes the culture underpinning Furu Ikea and makes use of it in a different way and exposes it and plays with it. How can that stand against the word salad? Now, okay, so maybe, maybe giving Japanese haiku to Google Translate wasn't fair. But then I see things like this and I think, okay, we, we don't play fair. So this was Mark Zuckerberg's post from the day when Facebook released their deep learning algorithms for their, under their underlying their machine translation. I'm gonna talk about deep learning in a second. But I wanna talk about hubris first. Um, and of course he's very pleased with himself and it is good that Facebook was sharing their algorithms. I have no question that this is good for computer science research. Um, but then we kind of get to the end of the post. Um, Throughout human history, language has been a barrier to communication. I'd like to know what he'd like to suggest we use instead. It's amazing we get to live in a time when technology can change that. Understanding someone's language brings you closer to them, and I'm looking forward to making universal translation a reality. To help us get there faster, we're sharing our work publicly so that all researchers can use it to build better translation tools. Knowing the translation of your words does not mean that I am closer to you. That does not build intimacy. It, 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 is, it, is, it has a place, but I'm not sure this is it. And this is the question where I start to think, okay, well, where are the boundaries? How can we start to understand what technology can do and where technology can end? Because this is the conversation I keep having. To come back for a second to those deep learning algorithms, and I'm sorry for the quality of this, 
Um, so one of the partners in the Kplex project is a Latvian SME, and they're very committed to building machine translation engines for smaller languages like Latvian. And so they're working on a neur neural networks based system. So they put in these four source sentences into an engine. So characteristic specialties of Latvian cuisine are bacon pies and refreshing cold sour cream soup. Uh, demand for mobile telephones and internet access has exploded. An insider's guide to drinking sake in Tokyo and part bookshop, part gallery, NADIFF highlights Japan's deep appreciation for art and design. Okay, so they're doing this in a, in a kind of a tourism context. So far, so good. All four of those statements came back with the same translation, which is there in the Latvian, which translates back to English as fast wireless internet is available free of charge in the guest bedrooms. I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. When I get excited, I start to speak too fast. So we have the fast wireless internet available free in the guest bedrooms. So the way this was explained to me is that somewhere in the black box of the machine learning, there is a place where obviously, although they couldn't say exactly where, where obviously there was a connection made between those kinds of sentences and that sentence. And that connection started to dominate what the learning algorithm saw as a correct translation. And this is a real problem with these kind of deep neural networks because we don't necessarily know, as with a lot of machine learning or a lot of AI, we don't necessarily know what's happening in the black box, which is really interesting because in my mind, once you get back to that question of not really knowing what happened and having to make a judgment call, having to make an informed analysis of material like that, you're coming back to the humanities. But that's another question. We also have work going on about the emotional side of things. So again, we talk about culture, we talk about memory, we also talk about identity and emotion. And this isn't anything new. Um, Alone Together has been out since 2011, but if you go back, you can find all of these kind of techno-skepticism going back. But one of the things we're looking at and querying is whether AI can be emotional or indeed ethical. Clearly, the developers of humanoid robots like Pepper or Paro, I don't know if you know Paro. Paro is a fuzzy little fur seal which responds emotionally to you. And on some level, it's interesting. and some level, it's quite frightening and quite, quite touching in a way. Um, but the questions are, that you find when you talk to AI researchers is not can it be done, should it be done, but just how it can be done. And I really find the question of whether, for example, you know, you probably if you study philosophy, you know the trolley problem. This question of if you have a choice to actually bring about the death of many or the death of few, I mean, are there some deaths that mean more than others? In the face, I was told that that was an irrelevant question by AI researchers, that this was never going to happen. And yet Lexis was actually exposed as looking into whether protecting the life of the driver of a, of a, of a driverless car, of an, of, a, of an automatically controlled vehicle, whether protecting that driver at all costs was a corporate policy. So the trolley problem has become real. And of course, I think when you start to say, I can program ethics, you just need to tell me how, I fall back on the fact that an ethical stance is an essentially human position. It is one, one fallible mortal being, being able to take responsibility for another. So there's a lot of questions being raised there. In the light of where we are, and just to give you a sense of the project, we're, um, we're about a year in uh, of a project that is a year and three months. So we're actually going into our write-up phase now, and we're looking towards the kinds of recommendations we can make. Um, and there's been quite a lot of quantitative work that will, will all be released in the fullness of time. Um, but what I wanted to do as a way of, of, of wrapping up this presentation is make five modest proposals. And I think these are proposals for humanists, but also for digital humanists, because if you work in the digital humanities, you generally occupy 
I don't want to say a unique, but a privileged position of being able to understand both of those cultures, both of the epistemic cultures of the humanities, where there's a certain prevalence and preference for sources and for uh, ways of thinking and ways of investigating, but also the software engineering side and the big data and the AI and the questions, the, 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 the conditions of possibility for knowledge creation in the two. So I would say these are, these are things that we can investigate. So the first modest proposal, um, and this is specifically looking towards the European Open Science Cloud, um, but more than that, I think we really need a discussion of if we're going to create knowledge from big data, we need to talk about what kinds of questions you can ask of big data. How do you learn to ask research questions that can engage data from a, 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 a sensor, an environmental sensor, and a literary text, and historical records? Do we know how to ask those questions? And if so, do we know how to ask them in a way that will engage the data that we are going to be offered? And of course, this question of shared ownership, because the shared ownership is not just important for archives and researchers. Shared ownership also exists between you and me and Facebook and the sensors that are taking our information and the, and the, the, the the, the new Amazon grocery store where there's no one at the till, you just take what you want and walk out and it knows what you have. There's a shared ownership of data there as well. And this isn't always respected. Um, and one of the things we're looking at in Kplex, in particular in terms of shared ownership but also provenance, is the question of a data passport. So if data in a European Open Science Cloud, obviously it's going to have some metadata attached. But how can we get that beyond a standard into something that really reflects where this data has come from, what it has been gone through, and what has been done to it, how it's been transformed, and what can be done with it going forward? Um, and again, the commissioner has said it. He believes that the most exciting and groundbreaking work, um, it's happening at the intersection of disciplines. So if we want to take him up on his offer of a European open science cloud, we really need to think about how to do it well. And that is for everyone. And I think the humanists are in a good position to actually make a real impact there. But also something that we're doing in Daria, the European research infrastructure that I mentioned, is we're bringing together stakeholders to try and develop a data reuse charter. Because we recognize that the individual researcher does not feel empowered to necessarily reuse data. They don't know. The paper that they signed for the archive, does that mean that they can put the data in an open repository? Does that mean that they have to keep it private to themselves? What are the conditions for sharing data? Data would be better available if it was shared more widely. It would be perhaps more sustainable if it was shared more widely. But there are still blockages in the cultures, especially between the researchers and the cultural heritage institutions. And we're trying to find ways of smoothing that over. So I think this is one of the things we need to look at. Another thing, as I mentioned, a lot of the problems that we're coming to now really need a humanistic approach. And I know there is science and technology studies. And I have a lot of respect for a lot of the work done in science and technology studies. But it does tend to be very social science based. It's what it is. What about the cultural approaches? What about the, 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 the understanding that humanists have of human motivation, of human values, of human activities, actions? Um, I think there's a lot to be had there. And again, I can't necessarily recommend that book to you, uh, which was written by someone coming out of Stanford, writing about the fuzzy and the techie, how they together make a perfect approach to technology. Um, but it's actually, it's interesting that the book exists at all. And the book in itself is interesting for how it views the, the way you can get a better intelligence out of combining these two approaches to knowledge creation. Um, and it's interesting, I, I mentioned fake science here because I was asked last week um, by someone in the commission, well, are historians worried about fake science? <laughs> I thought this is a really interesting question. I said, well, you really can't prove a lot of things in literary research or historical research. You can't necessarily prove them right or wrong. So we've developed certain ways of actually showing an argument, of showing 
a provenance of showing a way through a set of source material, um, which may or may not have biases, but at least the biases there are exposed. This is what postmodernism meant to me, is that I had to be careful about my own biases. So the idea that there are also things that we can say about the repeatability of science is another thing that has struck me recently as a, an approach that humanists, and in particular digital humanists, might take. So in this world where knowledge will become more overtly messy, then we need to approach it like a Beckett text, uh, something with doodles and scribbles and crossouts and things that we know a lot about. Next, we need to get past privacy protection and approach identity enrichment as a goal for big data and AI. Um, privacy protection, this is a term I've taken straight from the big data PPP. The companies are all on board for privacy preserving technologies, which is putting, I think, the cart before the horse, but it's also ignoring the opportunity costs of what we allow ourselves to not be exposed to the ways in which the, the digital, and in particular, the, the sort of the, 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 the social media platforms, the way in which they are affecting identities by not exposing us to culture. So there's a gap there as well. So I'd love to see us move from talking about privacy, which clearly has a monetary place in the minds of the, of the companies, to something that is more holistic, and that sees both the in and the out. Um, because you have people like this writer from The Guardian who says, I'm a typical millennial, I'm glued to my phone, my virtual life has fully merged with my real life. There's no difference anymore. If that's going to be the case, then it would be useful to think about what kinds of identities that are, are being built there. Um, two more quickly. Problem solving isn't enough. We need to be thoughtful, imaginative, and disciplined about our engineering and how we speak about it. And here is a place where, again, you can see very good work starting. I was quite inspired when I first saw the Copenhagen letter. I don't know how many of you know this, but it is an open letter signed by, I think, about 5,000 people at the moment, um, saying, if we are contributing to the building of technology, then we need to keep certain things in mind. And I would, I would highly recommend you go and look at it as a move towards uh, having a different kind of conscience within technology development. Um, and of course, things like the, the, the PLOS computational biology paper on 10 simple rules for responsible big data research. It's not, it's not rocket science, actually. There are things that can be done. It's computational biology, of course. There are things that we can do, and if there are values that are going to be emerging, I mean, I'm glad to see open science emerging as a value for science in Europe. But I'd love to see things about protecting the user, protecting the individual. Uh, I would love to see things like that emerge in the way we talk about big data. And I would like to see more um, focus. I'd like to see more um, what, what I would see of as a scientific rigor about the way we talk about this research coming through. And finally, I do think that there's a, a, I have a sense from the, the, the work I've been involved in that there's always a sense towards convergence. We want to converge everything. Everything will be digitized. Don't worry. So all we need is the right digital space. We need the right digital object, the right device. Well, I started doing this ethnographic work and I started taking pictures of my workspaces. These workspaces are not really going to converge. They're messy. And know what? They're messy for a reason. They're messy because the information I'm dealing with is messy. They're messy because they're heterogeneous. They're messy because I'm working at different levels on different things at the same time. And if you want me to put it into Microsoft speak, they're messy because I'm chunking. I'm microtasking. You know, some of the stuff is very sexy in the tech world. But that is something that I think we need to push for more. You know, don't give me another VRE. Don't give me a one-stop shop. Give me a technical intervention that supports the way my research environment works. Give me a technical intervention that helps the way my life works. And then I think we'll have a better chance of that more refined hybrid intelligence, not artificial, not human, not biased in one way or the other, but able to check and balance itself. Because I do believe in the end, the fact that we, I am, I am a very human human, I suppose. We can't feel data. This is why seeing everything printed strikes you. We are physical creatures. We need materiality. 
So I suppose to end a talk about big data with the word, words we need materiality is a slightly uh, um, strong stance to make, but I hope that we can discuss it in the questions. Thank you. Thank you.